I say unto you, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You shall proceed no further, except with repentance. You shall receive no further. But many of you have gone on, and many of you have proceeded, and you trusted in the arm of the flesh. But I'm about to take my church out of the arms of the flesh, and she shall be led by my spirit. No doubt, anyone who is even slightly familiar with the history of the Church of God has at least heard of the Solemn Assembly. But what about the events which preceded this glorious time of deliverance? What caused it? Why was it necessary? Today, Jacob Anders, Victory Leaders Band Coordinator of North Carolina, moderates a two-hour discussion with four panelists who experienced these historic events firsthand. It is our hope and prayer that you will enjoy this discussion as we remember the events and experiences from 1966 through May of 1993, which necessitated the Solemn Assembly of July 1993. And don't forget, even through the difficult and trying times, God's hand was upon His church and He would deliver them. This is Remembering the Solemn Assembly. To my immediate left, Sister Deborah Perkins. Sister Perkins joined the church in 1969. She was called to preach in 1998 and has been pastoring our church there in North Carolina, uh, the Eflin Church, since 1999. Sister Perkins is probably most famous as a choir director. <laughs> and uh, although she did not lead a choir in the Solemn Assembly, she was a song leader in the Solemn Assembly. And uh, we're very thankful to have you today, Sister Perkins. Good to be here. <laughs> to her left is... Uh, precious friend, Sister Vicki Smith. <laughs> Sister Smith joined the church in 1970, which we learned is 52 years ago. <laughs> she was a licensed teacher in the Church of God of Prophecy in 1987. She and her husband served as national evangelist in the Church of God of Prophecy. And uh, she is, of course, the wife of our former general overseer, Bishop Stephen Smith. And uh, as far as her work in the Solemn Assembly goes, she was a part of the reception team as well as a singer and gifted pianist in the Solemn Assembly. And Sister Smith, we're, we're so thankful to have you. You're very gracious. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to my right is a man that, whom I know very well, <laughs> and my father-in-law, Bishop Donald Estep II. Uh, Brother Estep was raised in the Church of God of Prophecy, mm -hmm. raised up under his father who was a, uh, an overseer yes. in the Church of God of Prophecy during the time of the disruption. Uh, the grandson of Granville Estep, you right. may have read one of his books before, um, the mountain preacher discusses his life and right. his happenings as a, as a minister in the Church of God of Prophecy. He attended the Solemn Assembly with friends. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Eastep was uh, a member of the church at the time. He joined the Church of God of Prophecy in 1984, mm -hmm. became licensed to preach in 1999, began pastoring in 2000, mm -hmm. uh, became a bishop in 2012, and is currently serving as uh, our overseer for Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois. And, of course, National Overseer for the Philippines. Brother Eastip, we are happy to have you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. To his right, a man whom I consider to be a pioneer, a trailblazer in the church, <laughs> uh, Bishop Ray Dupree. Brother Dupree joined the church in 1954. He was licensed in 1965. Became a bishop in the Church of God of Prophecy in 1983. And whether he would admit this or not, he preached a message at the Solemn Assembly, which many of our interviewees have described as impactful and a major turning point in their lives. Uh, he was a former BTI coordinator and field secretary in the Church of God and is our current overseer of Kansas and Missouri. Right. Very thankful to have you, Brother Dupree. I'm happy to be here. We've asked each of you here today to discuss the events that led up to the Solemn Assembly. And each of you come from a different perspective, different backgrounds, served in different capacities in the Solemn Assembly. And we want to capture every experience that you have to offer and what led up to the Solemn Assembly. We could start, of course, in a hundred different places. I'd like to start with 1966, with the inception of the Higher Educational Institution. Some have described that they felt that education was more important for the prospective minister than his spirituality or his ability to be led, and of course, most importantly, called by the Holy Ghost. What were your feelings during this time I, I just began my ministry. I just started pastoral work. I came from a, a generation where if you acknowledged a calling into the ministry, the next thing that would happen, you'd be thrust into the work. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> without any kind of uh, formal um, education or anything. And to me, the idea of, of bettering myself by learning more uh, was appealing. It, it took me a little while to catch on to where that eventually was going to go to. But um, my idea, and I had a unique experience. Uh, uh, Brother Queener was my overseer back then. And uh, I wanted to go to Bible school. The only way I could get to go to Bible school would be uh, to move closer, uh, where it would be less expensive. And so I, I talked to him. I told him, I said, I think I'm going to move to Tennessee. And I expected him to, you know, we, we were kind of leaning in Louisiana on workers to discourage me. But he said, well, the, you know, I, I think what you ought to do is you ought to do that because the time may come that you can come back to this region and be a better blessing or a greater blessing to this region. And I thought about that when I was thinking about this question, that that time did come, uh, that when all of this <laughs> transpired later in later years, I was asked to go back to Louisiana and to open up that work. Mm -hmm. So during that 66, 1966, 65, 67, the idea of bettering yourself with a better education, of course, I came from Louisiana, the swamps, <laughs> and we had a unique education that wouldn't hardly fit anywhere else around the world. So I don't know why I got to go all the way around the world as I did later on, but it appealed to me. Uh, but in retrospect, looking back as that developed, uh, then I began to realize that there was going to be a shift from uh, the, the calling of God as it relates to the educational level of a man. And I've read so much of the material of, of our ministers, ministers in years gone by who had no formal education but were powerful ministers right. that helped me to get that balance in my ministry. I know you and I grew up under the same pastor, um, Brother Alan Anders, and often made mention of his um, lack of education and that he, he, he left, which I know many, many, of, the, many of the time did, left, mm -hmm. left um, schooling earlier than probably what they would have liked right. to because right. they had to help with the farm or they had to help in the fields or whatever the case was. But certainly mighty men of mm -hmm. men of God. What was um, your grandfather's education like during that time? I know it was grade school. He didn't get past that. His father was a logger, I believe, in the Kentucky Hills and was in a logging accident. And uh, so my grandfather wound up having to leave school, go home, just as you said, help on the farm, help raise the younger siblings and help take care of his mom and so on and so forth at a young age so his education i'll say grade school i don't want to put a year on it because i'm not entirely certain but right. grade school but one of the most powerful preachers oh. by reputation at least right. yeah. um, and many many others like him yeah, and of course we know there's no there's no sin in education mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong in that but it seemed as though based on what i have heard and you all can elaborate it seemed as though um men that did not have an education began to be looked down upon for their sure. lack of it. Sure. Can you describe that maybe a little? I think that probably probably one of the reasons that was pushed forward is the belief had, had developed in the church that uh, in order to, to have a, 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 a ministry to all that education was going to become important because if you lacked education, that just kind of categorized you in a particular mm -hmm. uh, category of people that you would be able to minister right. to. But again, I came up on a lot of these older ministers and, and I would, I would have went to uh, an arena where they were preaching to the president just to hear them because <laughs> they had the anointing. Right. Oh, they had the anointing. They yeah. had the inspiration. They yeah. had, the, they had the revelation of the word of God and, whether they had an education or not, that that was that was so so ingrained in them that you you would actually, actually they could speak to kings whether they had an education sure or not. Could. Yes, and and when that began to battle in the church, of course they pushed back because their idea is let's not get away from the the, the need to know that you're inspired of God and and revelation is important. You can't preach without right. revelation. Right. You have to have exactly. revelation. Right. And that education, you know, while indeed would be good and helpful, that education alone would would uh, diminish what we actually had that was working for us that would be good. Right. Uh, and I had I had no reason to fight against education or the the idea of getting a better education. 
Uh, You know, I finished out of high school and then went back to college, and I think it helped me. But uh, because I came up under this type of ministry, I never lost sight of the fact that this education is not going to get me anywhere as far as the ministry and spiritual things are concerned. During this time, it would seem as though there were some for whom formal education was as essential, if not more so, than divine guidance and being led by the Spirit of God. This lack of divine guidance created an opportunity for division to creep into the church. And as we know from Matthew 12, 25, a house divided against itself cannot stand. This division culminated in mixed feelings regarding the first official call to repentance by the Questions and Subjects Committee during the 1984 General Assembly. In 1984, the Questions and Subjects Committee calls the church to a church-wide repentance. And I'd like to read just a a bit of their report and exactly what they said. This is from the 1984 Questions and Subjects Committee report. This committee knows of no greater need to bring this assembly's attention than the need for repentance, the need to fall on our faces before God, confessing that we have drifted in many ways from a vital relationship with the Holy Ghost, confessing a self-centeredness lacking in deep compassion for a world who are living now under the judgment of God to eternal damnation, rededicating ourselves to being the church of God of the Bible. God's message to the church in this assembly has been a call to repent, and we must not ignore His voice. We cannot afford to continue the pursuit of our mission without convincing evidence of His presence and approval. There is no acceptable substitute for repentance when that is what God is calling us to do. With the moderator's permission, we would suggest that this portion of our report be accepted, not by a motion, second to the motion, but by those present in this assembly falling down before the Lord, thus setting the pace for the church-wide repentance to follow when these recommendations are ratified in our local church conferences around the world, where every local church at that time will likewise confess their failure in sincere repentance. And of course, I was not born at this time, and so I have asked many, many people in these interviews that we've conducted what was the church's response? And I'd like to take us to a section from Sister Perkins' husband, Brother Danny. And this is his response to uh, that, that particular question on how the church responded. Basically, you had what you just mentioned about a church within a church. You had one group that thought that the message was for one group, and the other group thought that the message was for the other group. And that idea that there was a that there was a, a real division in the church, and that based on which side you fell on, you believed the other side needed to repent. And so, as I began looking into these minutes, I found that um, the future general overseer, uh, Billy Murray, was on that question and subjects committee that actually called the church to repentance, and that that caught my eye. And uh, as I began studying more on that 1984 assembly, we found this clip uh, from Billy Murray preaching. There can be no repentance without confession. Unless we are willing to confess before God, we have drifted too far from divine principles. We will not repent and come back to God. until our eyes are opened. Now, to me, the VOB listening to that in 2023, it sounds as though he is on board with the call to repentance. It sounds like he is to use a word that will become very popular. It sounds like he's concerned <laughs> about the state of the church. Um Sister Smith, when you when you hear his statements and his call to repentance, and exactly when he says there can be no repentance without confession, what exactly do you think it was that the Questions and Subjects Committee, along with Billy Murray, w- was calling the church to confess of? Well, what I would understand now is much different than at the time maybe start with that what 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 your thoughts were at the time at the time i was confused and trying to figure out i remember 
I remember feeling, okay, I, I need to confess, I need to repent, but I'm not sure what for. I'd, I, I was confused for, you know, now, 2020 hindsight, um, we recognize that we were supposed to be repenting for being Pharisees, for, be, for being judgmental, for, because if you follow church doctrine, obviously you don't love souls. Mm-hmm. That's that's what we were being told. Yeah, my my perspective, I guess, is a little different from Sister Smith's, having had more direct uh, involvement with the general overseer working here in Tennessee, and and knowing more about where he was uh, and his thinking about the church and uh, the revelation of the church in Christ. And when when I hear this, even when I hear this now. I I have that same feeling I had then, especially with the reading of that report. The first section of that report indicates where he desires the repentance to go to, which was different from what I felt like the repentance call for repentance was. Uh, his his call, uh, even when I heard it just then, was uh, dealt more with the doctrinal issues and things like that of a church where I felt like. Our repentance more should have been for the drifting away from uh, uh, holiness and and the things of God that we had embraced over the years. Go ahead, sister. But that was later, though, right? I mean, this was this clip not earlier. What when what, what year was this from? This clip that we just listened to was from 1984. The 80, same 84, year. 84. So that's way before he was general overseer. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. And you and you, read the first section of that report again, if you don't mind. This committee knows of no greater need to bring this assembly's attention to than the need for repentance, the need to fall on our faces before God, confessing that we have drifted in many ways. And you hear that same verbiage, we've drifted from divine principles, from a vital relationship with the Holy Ghost, confessing a self-centeredness lacking in deep compassion for a world who are now living under the judgment of God to eternal damnation, rededicating ourselves to being the church of God of the Bible. See, that's, that's where it didn't resonate with me because I didn't feel like I had drifted away from the importance of souls and the gospel going to Which was why I didn't know what we're supposed to repent for. Right. But see, I understood where he was going because I had that, I had that time with him as an overseer and I knew that his push. So he was a state overseer? Yes. His push was towards that direction. Uh, Restudying and and getting the church in a, you know, in a different perspective. So I understood it from that. So when I heard that report, how it resonated with me was, I don't need to repent of this. It was almost like I want to reject that report. But because I, I know what I need to repent of, okay. of being too quiet and unwilling to say anything and almost having my head in the sand and not speaking up when I felt like I needed to speak up. Of course, I know most people won't believe that as we go <laughs> further into our history because I kind of lost that lost that feeling and I did get a little so more. So you felt like you your personal need for repentance was, I've been too quiet about yes. things that I see that are yes. evils. Yes, that I felt like if I had said something at that time, maybe somebody would have listened and we wouldn't have drifted away from uh, not so much from a vital relationship with Christ and our love for souls. That that just, I mean, even then, and when you read it then, I heard the, that still resonated with me the very same way, exact same way. I don't well, think we had caught on yet. <laughs> I, you know, being out west. When you out, say out we, west, you mean like the general. Out, out west, out, right. you know, where, where right. I was from, you know, in, let's see, we would have been in Colorado already by then. But, yeah, we hadn't caught on the move that right. was happening. Right. As our panel has discussed, there was much confusion and even division concerning the 1984 call to repentance by the Questions and Subjects Committee. However, this was just one of many calls to repentance which took place during the 1980s. Next, we will hear a call to repentance that came directly from the Holy Ghost. Many of the people we interviewed shared that this call increased the urgency for immediate and sincere corporate repentance. I say unto you, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I have spoken and said, you shall proceed no further, except with repentance, you shall receive no further. But many of you have gone on, and many 
and you have proceeded and you've trusted in the arm of the flesh. But I'm about to take my church out of the arms of the flesh and she shall be led by my spirit. I say unto you, there is a remnant and there is a church inside a church. There is a people inside a people and there is a nation inside a nation. I say to that nation, do not retreat. Do not retreat, but stand for the day of the Lord is at hand. It's one of the operative words that stuck out to me was when the Holy Ghost said, I'm about to take my church mm-hmm. out. Right. Right. And, you know, there's no way that I here in 2023 can force on to you, how did you not see what was coming? Mm-hmm. But when you look <laughs> back and you think about God saying, I'm going yeah. to take my church out, how did that how did that resonate with you then and how does it resonate with you now when you think about what you felt in the moment, but what you look back to see what God did? How did that how did that resonate? You know what it reminds me of is when Jesus said, told his disciples, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to yeah, die, and I'm going to raise again. And it's like they didn't get it. They didn't get it. <laughs> so how, how did we not get it? Yeah. Yeah. We look back now and say, how did we not get it? Yeah. If I could say because of um, the time frame that we're talking about, I was much younger. Of course, I'd been raised in the church. And I was not at that 1984 assembly. But the word got back to the field quickly that the Holy Ghost had called us to repentance. So you're talking about 86, the, the clip we just watched. Well, the 84. Okay. And then referring to the, both of them in okay. 86. But when we received that back at the local church, that call for repentance was slipping from a vital relationship with the Lord and that uh, we we were moving in the wrong direction and we needed to get back. And then that same call came in 86. Nowhere in my mind was I thinking right. what they were thinking. Right. Right. So when I hear that and listen to that, my mind was not thinking what they were thinking. Right. My <laughs> mind was thinking and, and in my spirit about repenting, because I didn't want to say I'm not repenting. Right. My spirit was saying, Lord, I want to be willing. Right. Right. And if I have slipped, if right. I have failed, right. you know, right. Uh, right. from following the Holy For Ghost. Sure. Right. Yeah, I, I think this is this is what the problem was, the the innocency right. of those that was not aware. Uh, say of, of the vantage point I was looking from. Right. See, it wasn't that I was I was against repentance, Lord. I knew there there was a great need for repentance. Right. But what had me hung up was what was being broadcast. We should mm-hmm. repent of. Right. And here I'm I'm a pastor working in a little church, and I'm doing everything I can to try to win people to the Lord. I'm I'm in the hospitals. I'm in the nursing homes. <laughs> I'm out, you know, in the public. I'm witnessing, and and I'm being told I need to repent because I, I, I you know, I, I've lost my my desire for souls. That that just didn't work with me. Although I knew that the church needed to repent, and but I think that's where the confusion came in. Mm-hmm. That even between ourselves, we we would almost have anxiety among ourselves is well why why are you feeling that way you know brother pre we, we do need well yeah we need to repent but not of what we're being told to repent of you know? well right. and the, the problem was i suppose looking back he never specified mm-hmm. in that entire clip or in the entire message right. what he believed yeah. right and even in the questions and subjects committee report it's a vital relationship with christ okay what does that mean what what part of that vital relationship has right. been severed? Right. And when we when we look back, we say the the vital part that was severed was the authority of Scripture mm-hmm. and what the Scriptures taught. Right. That was Church of God doctrine. In my spirit, even though I had been raised in the church, my dad was a minister, uh, and that's all I've ever known. I wanted it for myself. I didn't want it for my dad. I wanted to know that my I had a divine revelation. So in all of this coming about with this repentance, I'm thinking as a church as a whole, if if I've slipped, Lord, and, and I don't have the divine revelation that I need, um, that the Lord would help me. 
And as I said, the things that we were seeing on the field was different. And my spirit wasn't agreeing with what we were seeing. What were some things that you were that you were seeing? To name a few, uh, when we would go to ladies' retreats, things that advice to members taught against, we were seeing it used. Um, things that you question, you think, okay, if this is the church and we, we teach advice to members, these that are coming out of headquarters are not abiding by the advice to members. So were you seeing jewelry yet? Not at that point. Because right now we're at the le- mid to late 80s in our, in our no. timeline. No, not at that point. But in um, as maybe not in the form of rings. Right. 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 But, but you were. Talk s- about what you mean by that, Sister Smith. The spirit of it. Right. Well, then you had a lot of the brooches, too. That, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. not just, of course, I'm not picking on the ladies, but I can tell you from my own experience that the tie tacks and the cuff links. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went through that early on in my ministry when I I had finally got some people coming to church and I got to this jewelry issue and I had a tie tack on and cuff links and, and the boy looked at me and he said, well, I don't see anything different from that in my wedding band. Yeah. And that's, that cemented for me. I never wore another right. one. See, but, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the key issue, brother Dupree yeah. is, and we've actually um, got some clips of this as well in the future in 1991 on the stage, he's become general overseer at this point. Billy Murray is speaking and addressing people that are coming up and discussing. Mm-hmm. And he used tie tacks, mm-hmm. yes, cufflinks. He, mm-hmm. he used those yeah. things. Yes. But instead of correcting, as you did, right. and saying, if this is right. causing my stance to possibly look hypocritical, let's move back to safer yeah. ground. Instead of that, he said, since cufflinks are okay, and right. tie tacks are okay. Right. Why not open the door to yeah. other things right. which, which might be okay? Exactly. He didn't give opportunity but the, to that, repent, right. for us to repent and right. to yeah. us to correct. Well, because in 1991, and, and we, this is in the minutes of that assembly, in his annual, over, annual address, he says, Do we consider ourselves holier than he to whom the angels sing, Holy, holy, holy? Have we been too judgmental of some of his children? If so, would we not stand condemned before him? For that, would he not call us to repentance? So from his perspective in 84, and he, he's now let the cat out of the bag in 91, right. his call to repentance from the questions and subjects committee was a call of being too judgmental. Too judgmental. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Brother Dupree, I, I know that you actually approached the mic um, in, in 1991 and discussed that. Do you remember exactly what you said oh, dis- yeah. discussing that? I remember it very well because I had I had decided that I would I would submit if I could get the information that was being given. The information that they were given given to us is that at some point in time earlier in the history of the church this was allowed and that they had had that information in some booklet form and so when finally I got to that point in the discussion uh, with the moderator, uh, he told me, he said, well, we have that backstage, Brother Dupree, if you want to go back there and look at it. Because I had, com- I had committed to the fact that I would, I would submit if I could see that. I went backstage to, 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 to see that, and I was told back then that we don't have this booklet that they were referring to, that possibly that's, uh, that's with the, the elders publishing department and I was coming back around to go back on stage to, to let him know that you know I wasn't going to submit because I didn't get that information but the business had already uh, come to an end well during the course of that year I had the happy privilege of visiting in in the general overseer's office and that came up and <laughs> I said to him I said well uh, brother, you you owe me an opportunity to stand back on the stage because in reality I didn't submit. I was going to submit based on the premise that you had this information and I didn't submit, so therefore you didn't have unanimous agreement. Um, while I knew others didn't either, but anyway, from my perspective, and so I I feel like you owe me an opportunity to stand back on the stage and, and to let let the assembly know that we we don't have that information. And he just looked at me and said, I don't think that's going to be possible. Brother Dupree, I think the reason 
that he said it it wasn't going to be possible because it was never going to be possible. Right. right. It it was it was planned. Right. And I know that's a that's a charged word to say that this was planned, but um in the Holy Ghost message to the South Cleveland Church in April twenty fifth of nineteen ninety three he says, I speak to you first. Oh, I speak to you first. Lo, I tell you, there is a conspiracy against thee. I uncover the evil deeds. I show thee openly so that you may know. I will tell you later what to do, but lo, I tell you, the plan has been made. My children, they desire for you to cease. Right. And that is exactly what was happening. It wasn't, it wasn't a matter of whether you were justified in your actions or not, and whether you were justified in your request for the assembly to know, wait a second, there was yet another brother who was standing in opposition. It wasn't about that. No. And, and we see that from the fact, and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because we're, we're not quite there yet, right. um, but we, we see that there was a plan here. And I'd like to go back to, I believe we have this on the screen for you all to see, this was a document that was a part of a packet from a seminar taught at Tomlinson College. One packet was called An Approach to the Assessment of Organizational Culture in the Church. And this was a, uh, a part of a larger scale called Strategic Planning for Church Growth. Mm -hmm. I, knew that would, I knew that would ring a bell. Right. 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 And uh, before we get to that, you know, I, I have always heard stories about these types of, of differences and these types of um, beliefs in, in, in minds of people at the time, but I never understood the boldness mm -hmm. to put what they were actually going to do in writing. And in studying for this roundtable, we came across this document, and, I, and I'd like to discuss it just a little bit. This packet states that the church has artifacts which need to be addressed and moved on from. And just that verbiage, that, that terminology, mm -hmm. artifact, mm -hmm. it's old, it's outdated. Antiquated. It's, it's antiquated, and it is something that we look back to and say, that's, that's how things that used to be. That we roll our eyes at. Mm -hmm. That we roll our eyes yeah. at and think, right. how silly mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they used to do these right. things yeah. this way. Something to be embarrassed of almost. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of these things that are not on the screen uh, are included such as what I would consider non-essential, enjoyable, but non-essential. Things like marches, um, the parade of nations, things like that that are helpful to the church and a part of our heritage, but not essential to the church's existence. In other words, the parade of nations is not a part of biblical doctrine. Right. But this, this, this link that they go to here discusses doctrine which has been accepted by the church as biblical doctrine. They, they, they call the inflow, unanimous agreement, myths. Right. Mm -hmm. right. The taking of the covenant, feet washing, speaking in tongues as rites, as though, and when it says rites here, uh, note the spelling. This is not like something that is right, right to do. <laughs> right. It's right as in yeah. ritual. Right. It's right. ritualistic. Right. Right. It's something we do just to do it, and it's not being led by the Spirit. And we know, and I believe Church of God of Prophecy still to this day at least believes in the moving of the Spirit and speaking in tongues, but here they discuss it as rites, mm -hmm. slogans. They minimize the idea that we have the whole message for the whole world to nothing more than a slogan. slogan. On to perfection mm -hmm. is from the book of Hebrews. Yeah. Right. That, that's not a slogan. Right. They minimize <laughs> right. these ideas right. to slogans, visible symbols, the flag, Psalm 60 and 4. We, mm -hmm. we don't make these things up, but it right. was as though mm -hmm. they, they viewed these essential parts of the church as right. non-essential. Mm -hmm. All the way down, the last one there, the King James Verse. Bible. Right. And we now see where, where that has gone um, to the very Word of God that they used. I'd like to draw our attention here to an interview from my uncle, Brother Dwayne Anders, about his experience being taught this in a youth rally gathering in Pigeon Forge in 1990, if we could. I remember we sat down, one of the first things I noticed, there was no, no church flags anywhere, and there was nothing there identifying the church. A young lady was ministering that night, 
and then she began to preach. I remember us trying to locate her in the Bible. We uh, finally heard her say, if you're trying to find me, uh, I'm actually preaching from a New International Version Bible. Uh, if you're in the King James Version Bible, you probably won't be able to keep up with me tonight. I'll be preaching from this. The next morning, we came back into the convention center getting ready for some breakout sessions that they were having, some classes. One of the classes that was being taught was being taught by one of the general headquarters officials. They give us a three-ring binder, and that binder had documents in it. I believe the document was called Strategic Planning for Church Growth. And uh, some of the things in that document, as I looked on that, I realized we really were looking at something that uh, we had been hearing about change coming and uh, things taking place in the church uh, that really we hadn't seen in our area. We got to a, a section in that book, uh, I believe it was called Examples of Artifacts. Uh, some of those things that were listed in that that stood out to me at that time called myths. And some of those myths was the Queener stories, the inflow. Uh, things of, of that nature that I remember standing out to me. The Queener stories being one, uh, something we had grew up reading about uh, Brother Queener's missionary uh, trips, uh, that those kinds of things were kind of embedded into us. One of the other things uh, that really stood out to me in that was, was the, the inflow. Uh, we had been taught that all of our life, that there would be an inflow, and that was quite a shock to to me to see that we actually had general headquarters officials teaching in this class that was uh, sharing this. So we, we finished that first breakout class and made our way into the hallway. I was kind of beside myself. I couldn't believe what we had just been taught in that class. And I noticed uh, coming down the hallway was at that time our general VOB coordinator I knew of him and had spoke with him a few times in the past. And so I spoke to him and said, hey, can I speak with you? I want to talk with you about this. I honestly felt like uh, maybe something was being taught that maybe he wasn't aware of. So uh, I shared and opened the booklet to him and shared what they were teaching in the class. And uh, much to my surprise, he, he put his arm around me and said, uh, Brother Dwayne, he said, there is some... There's change coming. And uh, he, as a matter of fact, he even said, uh, as I question him about the inflow, uh, he says, well, we, we have been wrong uh, and we're going to change it. So change is coming. And then the last words he said to me was, I'll be praying for you. And I remember thinking, uh, well, I think I need to be the one praying for you because I couldn't believe what was being taught. So at that time, we made a decision to leave the conference and we left and made our way back home and shared the information that had been given to us. Uh, it kind of was not a surprise to those who had already been involved with uh, some of the things going on with the church and, and hearing and knowing much more than what we had known as young people. We were kind of surprised to hear some of those things, just really shocked at how it was unfolding, how plain and how openly they were bringing it about. Well, at that time when um, Brother Dwayne had went to uh, that meeting, and it was only a few that went with him, young people from the local church at Reedsville, we were, at that time, we had 30, 35 young people that were attending the church. We had a choir, and um, we were debating whether we would take those young people to that meeting in Pigeon Forge or maybe, you know, we would do something else. And we we did do something else. We took them to a church to sing uh, at Fields of the Woods. But when Brother Dwayne returned from that um, youth meeting, we realized that we had made the right choice. Because we, your mother was one of those that had come from the Methodist church, well taught, well versed in the Lord and the scriptures. But the Lord had begun to work not only in, in your mom, but in other young people, Brother Dwayne's wife, Amy, uh, and many more young people. And we were teaching them the teachings of the church, uh, the principles, the doctrines. And uh, we were taking them to these 
state functions. And when we would get there, the things that we had taught them hmm. that we didn't do, they were doing. Right. And it was very confusing to our young people uh, what was going on. You know, okay, you're telling us, you know, that the church takes a stand against this, but we get to these functions and they're doing it. So the Lord really had to help us uh, because it was a very um, scary time mm -hmm. because you had all these young people that you were trying to work with and God was genuinely working in their hearts. And you know that for a fact because your mom's been in the church right. how long? Uh, 30 years now. <laughs> so God did work. God was working. But it was such a serious time that we were working with those young people uh, because we could have went the other way. Right. We could have uh, stayed the course, and that was our general uh, VLB coordinator or leader at that time. Uh, had we stayed that course, we would not be where we are today. Right. But it's because of the grace of God and because Amen. of our leadership, right. people that had taught us the truth, taught us to stay the course. Right. And and I'm thankful that we did. Right. You know, during that time frame, it, it was so bad in our youth camps. I made a, I made a choice as a father, not as a minister, that I would no longer. We were active in the camps. I mean, I served at various uh, positions in the camps in in Tennessee, but it had gotten such that we we decided we would begin doing family vacations mm -hmm. and got them out of that camp. And when I was asked why we did that and we wouldn't participate in camps anymore, my 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 answer was just simply, I'm not going to have my children reindoctrinated. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, they were using these yeah. uh, these avenues where they would isolate uh, the young right. people right. and get these ideas in their heads, and I, I just was not going to accept that. Well, and that document, it was the complete undoing oh. of everything. When I saw it, it just complete. It seemed like it was fake. There's no <laughs> way yeah. this was actually yeah. taught. Yeah. I, I think that doctrine was developed by Tomlinson College. And I think I know who developed that yeah. document. But. but when you were in that moment and you were experiencing what was unfolding and you knew that in your heart and your spirit, it was wrong. Right. And you were, I mean, that's why as we begin to, um, we're talking about the solemn assembly became so much more important, even though we had not gotten a message the Holy Ghost had not called right, for that. Right. We knew in our hearts something, something. was something going to have right. to take place right. because we were headed mm -hmm. in the wrong right. direction. Right. Right. And I remember right. when, when Brother Dwayne told me, he said, he told him change was coming. And, and that almost would take the breath away from you. Right. Because, I mean, we were just uh, settling in and, and we were raring and ready to go to work for the Lord, the Driving church. Youth department. Yes. Right. Right. And, uh, but everything that we were teaching them was unfolding. Right. Does that, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. not that it wasn't real anymore, but they were tearing down. Right. Right. And I think that's what emboldening, and I guess I don't know whether that's a good word, many of us to be able to be, to able to be able to accept the solemn assembly. Not only just the Holy Ghost message, but because of 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 the accumulation of these things that we had all been taught, stick with the church. Right. Don't right. stay in the ship. Don't yes. you know? Right. You know, our whole God's lives. Going to take care of it. Obey all of those our lives. over you. And, yeah, and mm -hmm. to go against that, I as a matter of fact, my own father sitting in my living room when he when he uh, seen that I had gotten involved with the concern, uh, just nearly rebuked me and, and said, "Son." You can't do this. You know, you've got to stay with the church. You've got to mm. stick with the church. Right. And God's going to work this out. Yeah. But little by little, as we've seen the hopelessness mm -hmm. of it being worked out, right. and we began to feel the Spirit moving in, in the direction yeah. like that, it, it just, you know, is, is a fine line between uh, rebellion mm -hmm. and and following right. your heart. And And I found that in Jesus' word when he said that the shepherd can enter the sheepfold. Everybody else goes in as a robber right. and a thief. I can go in and I can lead them out and then I can lead them back in. Right. And that that scripture alone really helped me to get to a place that I could see 
hey, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, right. but I'm going to get my eyes on you because right. I want to be able to follow you and be successful wherever this lands, eventually lands. In one of our interviews, Sister Becky Horn discussed this, and we actually have the video I'd like to show you. She discusses the fear mm -hmm. and the caution at the possibility of um, right. putting themselves uh -huh. outside of God's church. Let's, let's take a listen to that. I think it's because we knew this to be the Church of God, the organization we had been in, and we had been taught and trained and saw scripturally that God has one church, and with everything going on, that the government of the church was going this other direction. And suddenly we were finding ourselves in a situation where it was looking like there was going to be a separation, and just the great fear of somehow being out of God's church through the things we were doing. We were trying to tread very, very softly and make sure that we didn't find ourselves out of God's church. It was a it was a terrifying time because of that. As I listen to Sister Horn talk, it reminds me, it was kind of in the same era of time when I can recall I was about 16, 17 years old. I'd been raised in the church all my life. I knew things weren't right, but I don't know if I understood completely why. But I can remember my dad in that time, I can remember standing in the kitchen around the counter or sitting in the car, wherever it might happen to be, and dad was church had gone to the core. And I can remember him feverishly with everything he had in him, trying to lead me to the place where God could reveal the church to me. I think he knew that I was getting ready to, with everyone else, face a time when we didn't know where to go and when it would be necessary to walk softly, but to grab on to the only thing that was going to last, right. the right. only thing that was going to give us any safety was going to be the revelation mm -hmm. that right. God had given us from the Word. And it, it's just it's awoken some emotion in me, but it was a frightening time. It was a time when you wanted to walk softly. And even with my lack of experience and understanding, I could see things were changing. I didn't know where it was going to end up. But little by little, God began to work in me and give me a determination to stand where he wanted me to stand. Right. And when it all cleared, I wanted to be with the Lord. Amen. I wanted to be with his church. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had some experiences, other experiences of that kind, but that just made me think about that, how strongly my father felt, and how much he loved me. He wanted me to be able to see it. He knew he couldn't give it to me, but he wanted to leave me there if he right. could. And I think, I think Brother Estep the first <laughs> <laughs> knew that there was a time coming where a Mount Carmel experience mm. was coming. And of course, we, we end up there in, in 1993 with the Solemn Assembly, but there were many other times before then, Mount Carmel experiences, where someone had to stand up for what was right. And the problem is people did, but they were not heeded. Right. Right. And we see that in, uh, in 1990 mm -hmm. with the health of Brother Tomlinson failing. Yeah. I believe in March of 1990, he sends out a letter calling for a general meeting of the Presbytery. Um, and from April 30th, to May 2nd, they meet to discuss the installation of, well, they, they met to discuss <laughs> one thing, yeah, right? Right. Yeah, right? But by the end of it, something right. new, new right. had happened. As you will see in just a moment, General Overseer M.A. Tomlinson sent a letter to the other members of the Presbytery calling them to Cleveland for a meeting on April 30th, 1990. Brother Tomlinson, having faithfully served the church as general overseer for over 45 years, was advanced in age. His health was declining, and he was seeking the Spirit's guidance to direct his decisions regarding the future of the leadership of the church. While we do not precisely know his plans for the meeting, we do know that some felt that this calling of the meeting was the equivalent of his resignation, creating the opportunity for them to select a newer, younger overseer who would take the church in a direction that fit their vision. Brother Estep, I know that your dad was involved in that Presbytery meeting sure. of 1990, and uh, I'd like for you, if you have any stories or anything to, to share about maybe what he shared about, about that meeting. One of the things that is 
striking or was striking to me at the time, and even when we look back on it, is how quickly they dealt with the matter at hand. It's a pretty serious situation yes. that they were dealing with. And I believe with all my heart, Brother Tomlinson had the right thing in mind for the church. But unbeknownst to him, there were others that didn't have the church's best interest at heart. And now looking back at it so many years later, it's very obvious to us now. In those days, we didn't want to mistrust anybody. Right. We still don't. You right. know, mm -hmm. uh, These are our brothers. These are our leaders. Right. These are men that we've looked to. And so it, it's difficult for us to think mm -hmm. in this manner. But looking back, it's obvious this was a, a planned thing. And mm -hmm. it was easy to get it done when you right. got there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that my, my dad had shared with me that, to me, kind of makes it seem as if it weren't being handled as seriously as possible were things like, for instance, there was a time when they were going to vote on the matter at hand. To begin with, we don't do that in the church. Mm -hmm. That's not how theocracy mm -hmm. operates. We work right. until we have a unanimous right. agreement. Right. And we can all feel the same and say mm -hmm. it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. But they came to this place when they were going to vote, and all of these grown men, bishops in the church, were asked to put their head down like little children in school and raise their hand if they were in agreement mm -hmm. or not in agreement. To me, just looking back on that, and that's an eyewitness account that can be verified mm -hmm. by a number of people yes. that were there. Right. Right. We, we know that's how it was done. There was never any intention, I don't believe, of truly finding God's will or God's plan for the church in that hour. There was definitely seemingly a plan in place right. that would right. be carried out. And again, we look back at it now. You know, we don't have our rose-colored glasses on anymore. We can look and we can see and maybe to some degree there was a purpose for us not to be able to see so clearly because I believe the hand of God was at work in all of this too. God knew what was going on. He knows what what's meant, in the heart of some, every man. What some may have meant for evil. Right. He, he knew, evil. but God meant it for good. Whenever man's got a plan, you can be assured God's right. got a better plan. Right. You know? right. And I think we can look back and see that. Did your, did your dad, when he went, do you think he realized he was going to come home with a different general overseer. I don't think so at all. In fact, I could feel like I can say I know he didn't feel that way. Um, if anything, he might have had some suspicion of what was up. I don't know if he did or not, but uh, I don't think that was in his mind at all at that time. I well, and, and I think we know that based upon the letter mm -hmm. that was sent. And we, yeah. can, we can look at the screen here to see the letter that was sent. The overseers met from April 30th through May 2nd, 1990. What was initially called a presbytery meeting evolved into an overseers meeting due to the general overseer leaving the meeting. As Jacob Anders mentioned, some dear and faithful brothers in that meeting who have continued with the Church of God after the reorganization are men such as Herman Ard, Clive Jared, David Risch, Alvin Brantley, and Bill White. Our panel continues now discussing the nature and ultimate result of this meeting. Dear brother, as of this date, I am notifying you of a general presbytery meeting to be held here in Cleveland, Tennessee, beginning April 30th, 1990. This meeting will convene in the Tomlinson College Chapel at 1.30 p.m. and is being called by your general overseer to pray and seek God's will for the future of the Church of God and the office of the general overseer relative to my current physical condition. So this letter that he sends out indicates there's no mention of installing or uh, voting or any discussion of an installation of a new general overseer, interim or not. The meeting was held to discuss the physical condition of, of Brother Tomlinson. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And he was well within his right as a general overseer to call a presbytery meeting because the only person or entity in the church that could call a presbytery meeting would be the general overseer. Mm -hmm. An overseer meeting is usually called when there's a death or potential resignation of the general overseer. And uh, in that case, in studying the, the tapes and, and the, what written material we have, uh, the transition never was made because M.A. Tomlinson, when he was pressed uh, to resign, he just simply said, well, I guess I'll just have to leave and let you guys do whatever you need to do. And so 
To me, it never transitioned over into an overseer's meeting. Maybe in their minds it did, and they felt like they had a resignation by Brother Tomlinson leaving and had the right then to go on with uh, their, their, uh, their business that they uh, had planned to do. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, from this letter, and, and there were indications uh, that, that I had uh, in the people that, you know, well, I had conversations with that really M.A. Tomlinson, he was of such a pure heart, even if it, it was in his heart to, to, to uh, resign, he didn't want to do that without knowing, having an acknowledgement of the Holy Ghost. He feared that much that he would, he would fail God, fail the church, if there's something that the Holy Ghost didn't want him to do. And if the Holy Ghost didn't want him to do that, then there could be people around him that could help him with the work. Mm -hmm. uh, that he could bring on board. But he did not want to give a resignation until he was sure this is what the Holy Ghost wanted. Well, and because at that time, there had only ever been one general overseer right. before, before right. him. Mm -hmm. And that general overseer had, Died. I believe it was in 1914, the, general, or excuse me, the Holy Ghost gave a message in interpretation, right. which led everyone to believe that he was to serve until he died. Right. Right. And so, right. of course, M.A. is following in his father's footsteps. Mm -hmm. And for all intents and purposes, is desiring to serve until he dies. Right. So I guess we never really know what what his intention was in that meeting, but we do know that he wasn't dead yet. And that has be become a, a famous right. line. And we, we've got that video. Right. If, we right. could, if we could show that, M.A. Tomlinson speaking about his death that has not yet occurred. <laughs> yes, sir. But Tomlinson, uh, if I understand what the assembly has told us, uh, it says that in the event that the office of general overseer is declared vacant, that the general, that the uh, sec, the overseers, the presbytery will come together, choose a moderator, and proceed from there. Uh, I think it'd be wonderful if you would would serve interimly, but I don't understand how we can. Uh, I'm not dead yet, brother. I know that, Bishop. I'm not. Dead. It has to be. They have to be gone off for less. Well, I, I don't understand that being the reading of minutes. Maybe I need to look it up. Pardon. And I understand M.A. Tomlinson to be, I never met him, but all the stories that I've heard, an incredibly humble man. Yes. 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 And for him to speak what I guess you could describe as forcefully, yeah. I'm not yeah. dead yeah. yet. Yeah. It was because, it, and that, that dear brother yeah. there was saying the office had been vacated. Based on the reading of the letter, he never says his desire is to vacate the office. Right. He could have been asking for help. Right. He could have been asked, as, as you shared with, uh, as you shared, Brother Dupree. Right. Brother Hawkins um, wrote, a, wrote a statement concerning this that I'd like to share. He says, It was being argued by some that the only way they could proceed with the meeting and choose an interim, interim general overseer was for the office to be declared vacant. That was not true. The ruling only stated what would be done in the event of a vacancy. And we know, of course, the office was not vacant. As he so eloquently right. said, I'm not dead yet. Right. However, they were in a situation where the office was still occupied. It was not vacant, a situation not addressed by the General Assembly because until that time, mm -hmm. they had never dealt with a vacancy right. in the, uh, unless there was an event of the General Overseer right. passing. Right. It was new territory. Brother Hawkins goes on, Since the General Overseer acts for the General Assembly when it is not in session, Brother Tomlinson approached this situation the way he felt the Lord would be pleased, which he was authorized to do, which is exactly what you said earlier, right, right, right. Brother Dupree. However, those that were misguided continued with the spirit that forced Brother Tomlinson to step down, and we can see the fruit and end result of this unfortunate event in the choosing of an interim general overseer by voting, which we've talked mm -hmm. about already, by democracy and not unanimity in the theocratic procedure. And, and we know, not to belabor this particular point, but we know what happens in this meeting. Right, right, right. The, vote, the vote takes place, which and we really don't know if that vote is accurate or not because everybody's heads, was, <laughs> heads were down. But the vote that, <laughs> the vote that we've been told yeah. is 48 to 33 right. with five abstaining. And we know that as the year went on, uh, Billy Murray served as interim general overseer until the General Assembly that year. And uh, the Questions and Subjects Committee presented him for acceptance and installation as permanent general overseer. Right. And yet again, in that general assembly, right. he was installed without unanimous agreement, right. Right. a pattern that would continue in, in the coming years. 
So we get to 1991, which is where um, this has all been rushing to. And I want to give some context for the listener that may not have a clue how momentous 91 was. Everyone always jumps to 93. Mm -hmm. And in in the big scheme of things, 93 is is the Super Bowl. But for our meeting today, 1991 was the pivotal General Mm -hmm. Assembly where everything changed. In 1991, they, they... began the questions and subject committee did discussing uh, the office of the general overseer and what how in what way he was to be accepted of course because now they didn't want another uh occurrence of what had happened previously they didn't want to have to go through that again they didn't want people upset that there wasn't unanimous agreement and so the questions and subject committee in their report um pushed through the idea that a general overseer can be accepted without unanimous agreement, and we understand that because in the document we looked at earlier, unanimous agreement, according to the strategic planning document, was now a myth. Right. It was a thing. It was an artifact. An artifact. It was something that was left behind. And I actually have that here that I'd like to share it it with you. This is from the Questions and Subjects Report, uh, Section C, page 27. After review and prayer for special guidance of the Spirit, Overwhelming consensus should determine the man for the position of general overseer. This should reflect Acts 15 and 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to the overwhelming consensus of us. <laughs> but we know that's not what the Scriptures say. It seems good to the Holy Ghost and to us. And, and, to to us. us. Yeah. and for, I guess that was 91, for 88 years, mm. that meant all of us. Right. Every one of us. Right. But now, because they had gone through a time of where overwhelming consensus was needed in order to for the plan to succeed we see that this this change has been made official by the general assembly the note says there should be no reasonable doubt in regards to the selection it should be generally felt generally felt that god has made the choice and therefore endorse, endorsement should be demonstrated by an overwhelming consensus mm. And we see that word overwhelming consensus, and I'm harping on that because in the near future, everything that happens will not be done by unanimous agreement because we were a divided house. I'd like to share um, a part of the Questions and Subjects Committee report (coughs) where um, actually the General Overseer speaks and addresses the assembly. Of course, in that assembly in 1991, the 26th teaching was the hot-button issue. Mm -hmm. It was the... The, the the end goal, it was where the snowball had been building and building and building yes. to that right. 26th teaching. And the statement was made over and over again that we're not trying to change the 26th teaching. We're not trying to change the 26th teaching. We're not trying to change the 26th teaching. And Billy Murray argues that he makes it, it makes an interesting claim, which I've not heard uh, before. I've never seen record to, to prove it or to disprove it, um, but he argues that the church allowed wedding rings until 1944. Does that claim substan- substantiate the changing of the ruling? Even if it were true, does that substantiate the changing of the ruling? And he says that he has instructed the question and subject committee to discuss this in this assembly. When I came in the church in 1942, the church did not this ruling in 1944 had not been made. Do you understand? I said, when I came in the church, when I took the covenant, this 1944 ruling was not in effect. The most official records that we can find indicate that there was an exception made for the wedding band at the time I became a member of the church 50 years ago. I wish we would simply see if we are on Bible ground totally and that we're consistent in our interpretation of the Bible. We did change. We did change in 1944. We made a change. Up to that time, if I understand correctly, there was an exception made for the wedding band. These brethren simply are trying to take us back to 1940 or 42 or 43 or beyond that. But if we were right to make that decision in 1944, if we were right, and you can support it, 
We were not on Bible grounds until that time. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we were not on Bible grounds until 1944, then we need to accept 1944 decision that that put us on Bible grounds. But it's a little, a little difficult for me to understand that as long as A.J. Tomlinson lived, we were not on Bible grounds with his teaching. That's difficult for me to understand. Maybe right. Maybe right. But I do think that we need to face reality of what we're dealing with here. Brother really Step, I'd like for you to you to comment on his statement. We were not on Bible grounds during the time of A.J. Tomlinson. I think I would approach it like this. Begin with the statement's invalid, and what makes it invalid is the fact that if you consider the history of the church in 1903 or in 1906 or 1915, right on down the line, we continued to grow in knowledge as we studied. As we learned what the Bible said and understood it, the General Assembly, which is a judicial body, right, it judges what the Word says and determines where we need to stand. For him to make that statement, it could be made the same way about our teaching on almost anything. Those first 30 or 40 years, we continually in our General Assemblies, did we not come together and study the Word of God so that we could go home and say, thus saith the Word of God. And we could adopt those things as our teachings. So for me, when he makes that statement, he, there's an attempt being made there to play on people's emotions. Right. Because, you know, the name A.J. Tomlinson certainly means everything to us. We appreciate that brother and what he did and how God used him. And so he kind of makes it look at this, oh, if we do this, are you saying that A.J. Tomlinson was wrong? Mm -hmm. A little bit of misdirection going on there, isn't it? Well, and on that strategic planning document, yeah. mm -hmm. A.J. Tomlinson's name is mentioned yeah. in a list of exemplars. In other words, people that should be examples to us. Right. Now it seems that he's willing to look the other way on some other things which mm -hmm. A.J. Tomlinson felt very strongly about. Right. But it almost seemed like, like he was using A.J. Tomlinson yeah. to make a point. It was an attempt to play on emotions, to get people to look at it as if, oh, if we say this, we're saying A.J. Tomlinson was wrong. We can't say that. And to me, looking at it, it was just an attempt to sway people's thoughts in a certain direction, to get people to accept something that most of us, I feel like many of us at least, felt was unacceptable. Right. And certainly this was unacceptable. As stated in the Bible Training Institute course material, the jewelry issue was first addressed by the Church of God in these last days in the 8th Annual Assembly in 1913 when the question was asked, can we afford to adorn our bodies with gold or pearls or costly array? General Moderator A.J. Tomlinson answered, unnecessary jewelry such as finger rings, bracelets, ear bobs, lockets, and other kinds for mere adornment should not be worn. Although this was not made a subject for discussion and acceptance by the assembly, as later became the established practice, there was no mention of opposition, and it has stood on the record from that time until now as Bible doctrine, forbidding the wearing of jewelry. Additionally, it was included in the list of teachings found in the assembly minutes of 1914. The document referenced by the general overseer in 1991 was a publication known as the Book of Doctrines, published in 1922 by the Church of God Publishing House. In its introduction, it states, Now, if a minister of the Church of God preaches a sermon on these important themes, it does not mean that he expresses a creed for the church. Neither does this book promulgate a creed. This document does not claim to be passed by the General Assembly, nor does it claim to be an official stance of the Church of God. The church's stance on gold for ornament remained unchanged even amidst the turmoil the church was facing from 1921 with the adoption of the Constitution through the ultimate disruption of 1923. In History and Polity, author James Stone goes as far to say, with the adoption of the Constitution in the 16th Assembly in 1921, the church officially ceased to practice theocracy. This further illustrates that deciding church doctrine based on this publication was invalid, to say the least. In 1944, 
the general overseer, M.A. Tomlinson, strongly admonished the church against the wearing of gold for ornament of any kind. He says, when our members wear rings, they have just backslid that much. If people are wearing gold for ornament 99 times out of 100, you will find some other sin in their lives. When people wear gold, they don't have enough salvation to shine, so they put on something else to shine. It is my desire for all our people to leave off all unnecessary ornaments. If you have salvation, you have enough beauty without wearing a wedding ring. We want to stick to the teachings. When he says we want to stick to the teachings, he is referencing the answer his father had given in the General Assembly of 1913 and this teaching's inclusion in the official list of teachings beginning with the 10th Annual Assembly Minutes. Following this strong admonition from the General Overseer, the General Assembly, through the passing of the Questions and Subjects Committee's report, recognized the General Overseer's words as an official assembly ruling and took a stance concerning what had first been addressed in 1913. We see a similar example of this in recent church history. In 1981, the Questions and Subjects Committee's report stated, We therefore recommend that this assembly go on record advising against abortion. After the admonition of the annual address from the General Overseer in 2022, the assembly strengthened its stance on the sanctity of life based on the words of General Overseer Oscar Pimentel. The wording was changed from merely advising against abortion to strongly declaring that we stand against all abortion and that life begins at conception in the womb. This is a similar process of what happened in the General Assembly of 1944. The 1944 ruling became the official teaching of the church, while the information contained in the Book of Doctrines from 1922 was neither official nor passed nor ratified by the General Assembly. Rather, it represented the views of the commentator and the commentator alone. This underscores the authority of the General Assembly as the ultimate judicial body within the church. Let's say he's right. He was right that there was an allowance made until 1944. The fact of the matter is what Brother Estep says a few moments ago is that it didn't matter. We see, we see um, in the last great conflict, A.J. Tomlinson in his writings makes some pretty strong statements mm -hmm. that in the footnotes say that he did not feel at the time of his death. Right. People grow and they change. Right. And so, learned. I'm sorry. I said, and we learn. And we learn. Yeah. Right. So for, for us to say simply that, well, a, w his statement we were never on Bible grounds during the time of A.J. Tomlinson is a charged statement right. meant to evoke an emotional response, right. which is, well, I've got to back off because A.J. Tomlinson could not have had something new to learn. Yeah. And, and the thing about it, as general overseer, he was, he was directly speaking against an established assembly ruling. Right. Mm -hmm. The 1944 and challenging the general assembly to go back and to see if it was not on Bible terms. Right. Mm -hmm. For a general overseer to do what he's asking all of his ministers not to do, and that's to get out on the field and <laughs> preach against what is established by the General Assembly. Right. He takes up in the General Assembly right. the, mm -hmm. the, the authority to say, uh, you know, we're not on Bible grounds. In 44, we got off of Bible grounds. Well, right. Who gave him the authority to say that? Right. And to do it so, if ahead, everything sorry, we're sister. saying is true. Right. Go ahead, Sister He Smith. went way beyond being a moderator. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. He, yes. he was pushing. An influencer. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And he blindsided us with stuff that we had never heard of before. So well, I've thought all of these is after the fact. I thought the one mistake I think all of us made was that he put us in a defensive position. Yes, he did. When we, we should not have been. We should have been on an offensive position declaring this is established assembly uh, doctrine. If right. you want to undo it, then you have to defend what your position right. is. Right. Well, brother, I think Dupree, we were all think, in shock, though. Yeah, yeah, I think the fact of the matter is, and right. and I want you to give yourself some credit. There were men that were on the offensive that yes. stood up. Yes. You were one of them that stood up and said, "This is wrong." Yes, and they were silenced. Hmm. And if they were not silenced, literally. They were at least looked over, and right. the, and it was right. passed on anyway. Right. Not to not to spoil the ending, but it was passed on. I remember one one gentleman that went to the microphone. I, I don't know his name, where he was from. I don't I don't remember all of that, 
but I do remember him going to the microphone. At this point in the, in the assembly, uh, Billy Murray had called for Scripture. If a man went to the microphone and did not immediately begin with a verse of Scripture, he would stop them and he would say, do you have Bible? Right. Let, he, and I remember even one point he says, let's talk from the Bible. So this gentleman goes to the microphone and begins sharing Scripture after Scripture mm -hmm. after Scripture. Mm -hmm. After, I bet he shared five scriptures mm -hmm. that, that were mostly from the Old Testament. And Billy Murray said, well, can you give me some New Testament? And the brother said, well, you know them. <laughs> and he says, how about First Peter? How about First Timothy? And Billy Murray in that moment says, we're not trying to change <laughs> what we already have. And the brother in pure exasperation says, well, then what are we doing? Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. And the assembly yeah. loses it. Yeah. Well, what exactly are we doing? Yeah. And it's because that brother stumbled upon the truth, which was what they said they were doing was not lining up right. with what they were actually exactly. doing. Right. And that brother, in all innocence, was just confused. Right. Then what are we doing? And we see... Despite the, the plea of you, Brother Dupree, I know that you spoke in that 1991 in that line of brothers that spoke against it. I know we have several brothers that were in the church, are still in the church today, that spoke in that line that said, I, I can't submit to this. I'd like for us to look at how that session ended and how uh, Billy Murray ended this session of the Questions and Subjects Committee in 1991. I really don't think we'll be served well by continuing the discussion. If we could please accept this report for this year, allow them to study the whole teaching for next year, and, and then whatever you input you have, make an appointment, meet with the committee, uh, they'll hear you. If, if we are missing it, surely we can find it. So we are, uh, could you all, could you all agree? Could that feel good to you? Let's just accept this for this year and keep studying it for another year. If you would, I'd appreciate it. As your general overseer, I will ask you to submit, please. Thank you. Thank you. Were well, you standing there for any reason, brethren? Were well, you standing there for any reason, refusing to submit? Would you would you talk with your overseer, please? Talk with your overseer, please. We don't want anybody to be hurt. We don't want anybody to be offended. But I feel this has to be brought to a conclusion so that we can go ahead with the rest of this assembly. Thank you, brethren. Thank you very much. It's been a laborious time for you. I you know, I think it's quite interesting. I've searched this at the minutes of that assembly, and I don't find that statement. Let's let's do this for this year. Mm. Right, right. Mm. I've I've got those here, brother Dupree. It says the general overseer stated there was no need to continue if we were not willing to listen to the Lord. However, dialogue resumed for some ninety minutes more. Because of, here's these words again, the overwhelming consensus that had been previously shown, the general overseer asked all those that still opposed the recommendation to submit and seek counsel from their state national overseers if needed. The accepted recommendation is as follows. In support of the general overseer's address relative to the assembly statement of 1944 that classified all gold for ornament as sin, we submit the following for your consideration as a replacement. A replacement. Body of Christ. But it's not a change. It's not a change. We're not changing it, mm -hmm. but it's a replacement. It's the body of Christ must be guided by the Word of God and the Holy Ghost in all manners of personal and corporal holiness. 
We therefore recommend that every member be extremely cautious in the wearing of ornaments for decoration, lest we offend the conscience of a brother or sister. See First Timothy two nine, First Peter three one through four. So they continue to use the same scriptures, but a completely different application of it. Right, and I, you know, I, I searched and searched because I made that statement that that's what he concluded it that we'd try it, let's try it for a year, right. and I couldn't find any any official records right. at all, and you know, I thought, well, I'll just find that video because I'm positive right. that's exactly how he brought it to conclusion. But uh, it, the records are not there, and, and that's what's unfortunate. When our young people search these things, right. if we don't have this kind of setting where that's these right. these little intricacies can be brought out, right. they'll never know that right. actually this is how it ended. It didn't happen. It didn't end the way the assembly right. man it says it ended. I got my hands on a letter that your dad wrote to Billy mm -hmm. Murray after this annual address and after this this assembly, and when the the change was made. He says at one point in that letter, if it was just the change in jewelry, if it was just the change in the 26th teaching, I could understand and go along believing that God would step in and make the change necessary. But it's the way mm. that it happened. Mm. Right. If the assembly had come to unanimous agreement and I was the only one standing back, and there was a brother that goes to the mic right before uh, Billy Murray did that. Mm. He said, brother, or Billy, brother, uh, brother Moderator, if I'm the only one that is standing, I will submit. But even the camera angles, the cameras show overwhelming consensus. But what we have seen in this documentary that we're creating and in the interviews is there, I know of at least 20 because, yes. because I've interviewed them. Well, right. I mean, his you know? statement implies that he was submitting for the rest of them that didn't submit. Right. Right. And I mean, for myself personally, I was backstage seeking information right. to submit by right. and never given the privilege to come up and submit. Or to find, you know, to say, to tell what I had found out, and to me, I, you know, that's why I requested that I should give be given an opportunity to speak at the next right. assembly, that I didn't submit. So I mean, if if it's just me or twenty others, the fact is that they just didn't have a unanimous agreement. There was not unanimous right. agreement, but they had already pushed through yes. the first part of the questions mm -hmm. and subject committee report, mm -hmm. which did away with the myth right. of right. unanimous right. agreement, and it had truly in that regard become a myth. Mm -hmm. It is a myth yeah. to this right. day. Unanimous agreement is no more. It has been replaced with consensus. The, the, I'll tell you right now, as, as crushed as I was, I'm just about as crushed again listening to that. I know, it right. hurts. I can remember we left, my wife and I left that General Assembly, walked out into the parking lot, yeah. looked back at the tabernacle, and she said, I don't feel safe in the church anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, we will not be here. We will not come back here again. And, of course, the mm -hmm. assembly was moved that next year. But I'd like to show you a clip from Sister Campbell discussing that exact same. And I know you were very close with the Campbells right. during this time. I'd like for us to discuss or watch this uh, video from Sister Campbell discussing that. When the, when the church first went, went, went astray, when theocracy was removed, and then the acceptance of something that is totally against the Word of God. I remember the devastation, and I never want to forget it because it keeps me reminded of how important it is to follow the truth. But I, um, I remember a hurt like I've never experienced in my life. I made the statement. I don't think I could have lost every family member in my household at one time and hurt any worse. It was the most devastating hurt to feel like everything we believed, everything we worked for, was just absolutely jerked out from under us. For me, one of the most beautiful things about the church is that for somebody like me that never really was sure where he fit in, here I know where I fit. And that was being taken away from mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. essentially. And I can remember my father and others, I heard it a number of times in those years because dad being an overseer, I would kind of 
trail around after him a lot, and I would hear his conversations with different people. I can remember people saying, I feel like a man with no country, you know, because for a little bit there, you didn't really know. It's like the boundaries are being right, redrawn, right. you know, contrary to the word. True. Contrary to what we knew to be true. And if you listened long enough, it would almost make you feel like you were the crazy one. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Like you were the crazy one. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank God I know now we weren't. <laughs> But uh, it was a difficult time, and but I do remember that. And I remember even as a young man, not even sure about everything, I just had that feeling. I don't know where I fit. As long as this, if that's what's right, then everything I've known is wrong, and I couldn't accept it. Who could yeah. accept that? Yeah, I, I can remember the young people, some of our young people in the local church that I pastored, the effect that it had on them was they were asking us, are you sure? Right. Are you sure it's not different? Are yeah. you that sure? Yeah. And, One brother said in, in, the, in the 1991 discussion, he said, do we really want to pass this with such obvious apparent division? Right. Yeah. And we must still to this day be yeah. so careful, careful. Yeah. That, that we don't want our way so bad right. that we're willing to push something through right. when there is obvious and apparent Division. I don't ever want us to make these mistakes again. Right. And I know, I, I know, and I understand what the scriptures say when when we when we hear of that he will bring the third part through the fire. Right. But I also think we do ourselves a great disservice to forget our history right. and to say that we are now immune mm-hmm. to this happening right. again simply because God will bring the third part mm-hmm. through the fire. Mm-hmm. But we didn't know that script. I mean, we knew the script. Right, We'd read right. the Bible, but we never applied that right. until this happened. Right. And it just makes me question. I mean, we would have said, this is God's church. It's going on to perfection. There's not going to be any other divisions. Right. And I'm sure we said that. Right. But we don't know what God has in store for us. Mm-hmm. And and what other scripture may be staring us so exactly, clearly in the eye that, that we, we don't aren't see understand don't until see. Yeah. And later? I just know that I want to be faithful. Right. Yes. Right. Amen. And, right. and well. watching this again hurts so bad again. Yeah. And yes, I remember that the, it felt like I was watching the bride of Christ being tortured. Mm-hmm. And like she was being murdered right in front of my eyes. And it just was incredibly painful and when we walked out because it was the business was brought up again right. after it supposedly was over for the year they brought it up again a lot of people had already gone home and um when we walked from the session out into the lobby and some people were just so jolly and happy and wasn't that great i mean knowing we were devastated and just like rubbing it in our face. They were so happy for this victory that was won at this assembly. It was just, it was horrible. We cried all the way for the 24 hours driving home to Colorado. We cried and cried and cried. Wow, the, 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 the stress and distress that was on us, my wife and I, we took to walking. We would walk around the school football field several times in the morning, in the afternoon, because we were in such distress. Uh, and what do we do? You know, the question then is, yeah, where do, do we go do? from here? Right. What, 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 what now? Most, what? I mean, as it, already been said in this interview, that we were taught to stay with the church. Yeah. Right, right. He's the savior of the body. Mm. Well, he did save the body, but he didn't save it like I had him. Right. Right. I imagined exactly. he would have saved That's it. Exactly right. Right. And he had to bring us to that right. fact that, we had to depend on him right. Right, and have the confidence that he is the chief shepherd. Right. And well, Brother Dupree, I remember from your interview, and I know something that nobody else in here knows because <laughs> I got to interview you. Yeah. Um, I remember you talking about God giving you a message yeah. that you didn't really believe. Yeah. And I don't, I know, I know, I don't want to get ahead to the solemn assembly <laughs> yet, but I, I just wonder, I'm sure there were many others at that time yeah. that, God was speaking to, but it was so difficult to believe it. And you're thinking, what? 
Right. Yeah, so like Brother Donnie said when we started question, am I crazy? I mean, we knew somebody was crazy. It was right. either they were crazy, <laughs> they've lost their minds, right. or it's me, but yeah. not everybody's well right. here. Well, the, the you felt uh, apart, away from where one time you felt like you yeah. were a unit. Mm -hmm. yeah. You felt very yeah. disconnected. Yes. Almost like oh. a civil war. Right, because you were no longer, it was almost as you could see the, the dividing lines. Yeah. Vulnerable. Right, and they were, they, uh, if you were wanting to uh, stay with the old pass, then you were automatically, Nobody wanted to have anything to do with you. Which, based mm. on what um, Brother Lofton right. wrote in his Book of Remembrance, he says on, on page 25 in his acceptance speech, this is the acceptance speech of Billy Murray after he was chosen, the new overseer stated that there were two groups of members in the church, conservative and liberal. He stated he wanted to be overseer of both groups, but he wasn't, is what you're saying, mm -hmm. that... that those who were considered conservative, which really is a wrong painting. Right. It's right. Bible based. Right. Right. Yeah. Biblical is, is exactly. the correct right. is the correct. Exactly. But let's use their terminology. Yeah. He wasn't the overseer of both the liberal and the conservative. And what strikes me so strongly is the lack of patience even to get this right. through. Right. He was put in in ninety and in ninety one changed mm -hmm. One, one of our vital teachings. No, one he, of the did, main it, he didn't change it. No, just replace. Yeah, replace. It was, <laughs> he, and that, which was the like, I'm crazy. Yeah. I've right. gone crazy because right. it's changed, but they say it's not changed. Well, and that, that, that teaching is one, it still remains to this day, one of the separating marks of the church. Mm -hmm. right. And it was, it's the replacing of that teaching, the changing of that teaching took away one of the identifying marks of the church. Right. Sure. Anyway, so right. Another thing we haven't even looked at is the fact that we were all sent home saying you can keep preaching the same thing you've always <laughs> right. preached. Right. Yeah, right. And Clarify that just a little bit, Brother Dupree. Well, when, when all of this discussion was going on to appease those who... The conservatives. Yes. Uh, we were told nothing's changed. I mean, that was the big thing. Nothing's changed. And so you can preach, just go back and preach what you preach. Uh, to your congregations, that was kind of used to appease us who right. are those who were in opposition. It wasn't myself. I was not. In, I was in opposition, sure enough. But and that carried through after the after the uh, the general assembly. Mm -hmm. They kept pushing that. Well, you shouldn't be upset. You know, you know, you can still preach the way you want to preach. But what was happening? It was becoming an identifying mark of you. And you was going to be tagged for replacement, yes, right. yes. Uh, because you you would not submit mm -hmm. to that, and you was continue to preach. The others who were preaching otherwise, they weren't having any problems at all. all right. But we who kept preaching, what well, was true when we run into problems with members in our congregation, they appeal to the to the overseer. That's when we begin to have problems. Mm -hmm. And what I went through uh, in my church, I mean, I just had a a, a few. But that few tipped the scales for us, and what I went through was at that at that state convention, when the appointment time come up, uh, the church was called out, and the overseer said unsettled. Well, one of my members was sitting by me said, well, "What does that mean, brother?" I said, "That means he don't know who who's going to be your pastor." <laughs> and they said, "Well, we know who's going to be your pastor." I said, "Well, listen, we don't rebel. Now I've been taught you don't rebel against authority." I was I was still struggling with right. this idea. Of, there was, I just didn't believe there was going to be a breakup of the right. church. Right. And, I, you know, somehow I was going to be able to survive. God was going to help me to survive. But right. I said, we, do, we just don't rebel against authority. He right. said, but I'm, right. I know who's going to be my pastor. <laughs> as horrible as it was in 91 and all of that time, we've said many times through the years, uh, it has brought us new friends. Yes. I, I, we'd never heard of Ray Dupree before. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and in 91, we didn't know his name. But we knew there was a guy who had a different color hair back then. <laughs> but he would go to, he more than once went down to the microphone and, and spoke what was in our hearts. And, and then somehow through the years, like it, it, there was connection made between those who had stood and refused to submit. Just, I mean, which is so scary because we're yeah. supposed to submit. 
Right. But that was so scary. Mm-hmm. But for fear of displeasing the Lord, they couldn't. Mm-hmm. Right. There were men who could not just sit down. Right. right. I'm, I'm reminded of two things I, I heard in my study of this. I've heard your husband say. One was he was preaching in an annual address back in the 2010s, and he said, um, he quoted the scripture where Jesus said, no man will have left father, mother, kindred, that I will not give him a hundred, a hundred more in this yeah. life. Yeah. And Brother Smith said, you know, we always talk about heaven's coming one day, but God takes care of us here. here. He does. And God right. takes care of us now. Right. Right. And uh, the, second, the second one was in the solemn assembly, he spoke and he said, for the first time in my life, I made the statement, I cannot submit. Mm-hmm. And that, that's where that it had tough. gotten to. Mm-hmm. So we're, we, we leave in that 1991 year. Mm-hmm. And 92 didn't get any better. No, no. Did not. <laughs> 1992, we see the closing of Tomlinson College. Yeah. And talk about memories. For those that attended Tomlinson College, also known as TC, mm-hmm. there, were, there were many memories made there. And it meant a, a great deal to many young people who attended uh, during this time as well. Uh, the Cleveland Daily Banner publishes an article that the Church of God of Prophecy has invested $336,000 into a trading firm known as Custom Trading International Corps. That investment had been lost, and the church was, I believe the Book of Remembrance says it this way, the church continued to say that all was well, Mm -hmm. but the article stated clearly that those funds had been lost. And in that video that we, or excuse me, in the uh, letter we saw earlier, in 1990, when this presbytery meeting was called in the second paragraph, M.A. Tomlinson tells those overseers which are coming, we regret to inform you, right. we will not be able to pay okay. for your trip. Had that, had that converted into an overseer's meeting, they would have been under an obligation to bring all of the overseers in, regardless of the cost. Right. And, right. and that's another point wherein it could not have transitioned into that right. because you didn't have your, your presbytery, all right. your presbytery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I believe Brother Lofton says it like this. Give me just a moment to find it. When the full impact of the news of this lost investment, which had been kept under wraps from the beginning, finally sank into the conscious, consciences of the people, it became the proverbial straw which broke the camel's mm-hmm. Back And it's in 1992 that we see this formulation of a group of people, which had always existed. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I say always, but it had existed at least back as far as 1990. And even as we've talked in this conversation, even back into the 80s and all the way back to 1966, right. Right. people who were concerned right. Right. for Bible doctrine. Right. We see that on August 24th, 1992, a letter is sent out to 4,000 members of the Church of God of Prophecy from men who were concerned. And we see that concern meetings begin taking place. Um, talk just a, a, a moment, if the two of you can, about um, the, the first unofficial meeting. There were two meetings during that General Assembly where we left the arena where the assembly mm-hmm. was being held and we went over to the local church in New Salisbury. I believe New Salisbury is where it was. Um, there were, I mean, I have actually Actually, I gave it to my son-in-law, but I have the original list of the people who were there who signed up um, to attend and wanted to be part of this group. Us personally, um, one of our drawbacks was that some of the people who were part of this had paid for, uh, they actually were bringing lawsuit against the Church of God of Prophecy for the lost investment and stuff and had like put things in the daily banner that against the Church of God Prophecy. Brother Smith and I didn't want to have, if right. that was part, if that was a concerned right. thing, like if that was what the concern was doing, we didn't want to have any part of that. We didn't want to have any part of lawsuits what or anything. What was your reason for not wanting Well, because of, of the scripture that says to go not to law right. Right. against thy brother, that it was a reproach. It was in obedient, diso- in our opinion. That's our understanding, disobedience to the Lord. But, you know, some of the main players in the concerned were, like, actually... Adamant. Yeah, yeah, they were doing that. And they felt like it was the Holy Ghost 
who was directing them. But well, and there are Holy Ghost messages and interpretations during that time that mistakes were made right. by the mm-hmm. concerned. And I think sometimes a false picture can be painted by folks looking back that everyone that was around at that time believes that it was all Church of God of Prophecy's fault and the concern made no mistakes during that time. Yeah. And and that's just simply not true. No, no. Matter of fact, one of the, one of the players at that time got really upset with me. I had preached, I think it was at the uh, Arkansas meeting. And I said, if this meeting is all about uh, the church being divided, I'm not interested in that. Right, right. But then I followed that up with the fact that uh, the thing that attracted me was that I could feel the spirit of the church yes. in that meeting, regardless of all of the other things that were going on that I had missed uh, in the Church of Battle Prophecy. That would have so, been the first. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. That would have been the first official meeting. Right. And, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I think any of us who was involved in that, uh, seriously, wanting to know what the Lord wanted, we, we felt the different spirits mm-hmm. that was, that was coming in even to the, into the concern group. That was a concern to well, us. One you know. thing I remember about the New Salisbury meetings, it was uh, kind of humorous in that these guys who were concerned and had tried to meet with the committee over at the arena with the Q&S committee and whatever, no recordings were allowed. No one was allowed to have tape recordings. of It was totally secret and private. And at the meeting in New Salisbury, it's like a press conference. Everybody's <laughs> got their little devices. You know, back it was, everyone was recording that. In other words, nothing in secret. Right. Like, yeah. we we wanted it to be right. known. Well, well, and I've heard reports about at the solemn assembly, you could look in the back and there were just rows <laughs> on rows of, <laughs> of cameras. Yeah, because it You guys had, didn't just use your phones? <laughs> <laughs> they were still at our houses hooked to wires. <laughs> we, were, we, were, we, were those, we were carrying those first, uh, first edition. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So I'd like for us to look. You talked about Jonesboro. Mm-hmm. Um, Brother Ammons actually talked about his excitement when he received an, an, a letter in the mail that said, You are invited. And he was so excited when he received that letter because. He didn't exactly know what was going on with the concerned, and it, he was just so excited to actually get to attend a meeting. And we have a clip that I'd like to show from from that meeting, a song which you'll all know very well. Um, if we could have that video. kind of see in those videos a, a mixture in the in the voices that you hear of rejoicing and also some agony. It, mm-hmm. it is a mixture of emotions. <coughs> Why did that particular song, and Sister Perkins, I know you sang that song many times. I've heard you sing it in the recent <laughs> years, so I can only imagine how much you sung it back then. Why did that particular song evoke such an emotional response from those that heard it? I believe up to this point, everything that we discussed was a part of that song. Because, I, and I do believe God put that song out at the right time because it, it was encouraging to the church. But listen to the words. We've got to go back to live in proof, back to absolute. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you listen to the first verse of that song, and, and it almost... The, the verses and the course takes you through what the church was experiencing. Right. And um, for, for me at that time, being the age that I was, uh, being, you know, 
my walk with the Lord was a desire to please God and to serve him. My family, we had two small girls at that time, or young girls. Uh, Danny and I, our desire was to do everything we can. We devoted our life, you know, to singing on the weekends. Right, right. And, and uh, But our desire was to please the Lord. Right. And to be a member of his body, to be a member of his church, was a great honor that you had a, a divine revelation of truth. And we were drifting from all that that we had been taught, theocracy. But when that song came out, it ministered to those that were feeling, I don't have a place anymore. Right. 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 No country. Right. 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 Because you were finding out how there, there's other people that's feeling just like I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Right. So yes. the message in the song was so vital to the hour that we were in, right. you know, and it just meant so much to me personally. And when you sung it, it, there was a rise of the spirit, right. whatever right. service you was in, it could have been a small congregation. Right. Uh, I remember singing it at the uh, solemn assembly. I remember singing it in concern meetings. Okay. Uh, of course we were in North Carolina and we were towards Virginia, those areas. Um, and even listening as they sung it here in Jonesboro, Arkansas, that same spirit that, right. uh -huh. that when I sung it in those meetings, I was feeling what she's feeling. Well, and that's just the first chorus. Wait till the second chorus right. comes, comes around. That was, that was just the first chorus. Like a sleeping a giant. Song. That's what I was about to say. That second verse talks right. about them will rise like, like a, a sleeping, sleeping giant. giant. And my dad loved that part. Standing yeah. He strong. went from the rim shot to the snare. Yeah. Yeah. Standing <laughs> tall in God's strength. Right. 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 And my, right. the power we've claimed for, for so long, right. it's returning. We're being right. made strong. Yeah. So it that, really does capture the essence of yes. what was going on at that time. It right. was a song for the hour. Right. And I think Sister Horn in her interview discusses the feeling, not specifically about that song, but the song captures it as well. She discusses what the feeling was during this time and what it was like in these concerned meetings. I'd like for us to take a listen to that was after all of the the things that were going wrong and feeling like the outsiders for trying to stand for what was right when we would come together in those meetings it was so comforting because you were with people of like mind and you were all going through the same thing it was people who were all devastated about what was happening and and not knowing what to do and crying out to God together and I remember feeling an instant bond and unity with people that we'd never met before, but we were of kindred spirit desiring the same thing. And that was, that was such a comfort during that time. And of course there were accusations made about the concerned mm -hmm. during this time. Mm -hmm. you, you referred a reference to rebelliousness mm -hmm. earlier. I'd like for us to go into a, another clip here uh, where Brother Campbell, who was underneath your, your ministry at the time, uh, had been told some things about the concern, and he shares his concerns with you about the concerned. And uh, well, I'll just let Brother Campbell tell the story if we could listen to that. In 1992, we had heard about a group that was forming in Indiana that was concerned about the things that was going on, and we def definitely were uh, were concerned about those things. Um, I remember standing with Brother Dupree and I in the hallway, and a brother came up to us and told us about uh, this meeting. We looked at each other and said, I won't have anything to do with that. It sounds like rebellion to me. And so we dismissed it like that. It wasn't until some time later that, um, that um, Brother Dupree had to make a trip. He didn't tell me where he was going until he got back. He had been asked to go to um, Arkansas uh, to preach during a meeting of the Concerned. And when he came back, he told me that he had rediscovered the spirit of the church. Brother Dupree, I would love to hear more about that story. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. There was, there was such a, an anxiousness in our local church. Actually, I was kind of put in a situation prior to going to Arkansas, where some of the members who had heard I was going to be going and uh, being involved uh, couldn't understand why I would go because the letter had been put out in our state 
requesting that we don't go. And I felt just so strong about going and had committed to Brother Pruitt that I would go and, and bring this message. And then I, I run into this with the membership, some of the membership, and I just felt like I was in a double bind. I, was, I would fail the sheep if I went, and I'd fail the Lord if I didn't go. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got to praying, wife, and I got to praying about it. And the people that were so strong about that within the next day came to me and released me from that, from what they said. Uh, prior to that, that if if this is something you feel that strongly about, we would not hinder you from going and we would not be ex- upset with you going. Well, when I got to that means, I think I've already said here, uh, you felt all, you felt different spirits. And, and in the course of that message, when I preached, I said, if this is leading to a separation or division of the church, I'm not interested in it. And uh, one of the... Uh, one of the players at the time that was strong in the concern meeting, he got quite upset with that comment. But then in a little while, when I come back around and made that statement that I felt the uh, spirit of the church in the midst of all of that, I uh, got back in his good, his good favors. Well, when I got <laughs> home, uh, as you can imagine, I, there was quite an interest in all of the people, the membership of the church. And I lost very few uh, from the congregation. Uh, just a handful that uh, went to the, you know, transferred out, and the Lord uh, enabled us to keep a, a good, strong church there as a result of that. Some of the things that were mentioned, I know the concerned, as we said earlier, sent out 4,000 letters mm-hmm. to different folks. And some of the things they were asking were, are you willing? The first four or five words of each question were all caps. Yeah. You know, this was important to them. Are you willing for the Worldwide General Assembly Tabernacle to be sold and to not have the General Assembly in Cleveland anymore? This is being rumored, which, of course, later, we're, no, I keep saying we, you were told <laughs> uh, by Billy Murray that that was, of course, a, a fallacious rumor. This is mm-hmm. not true. Right. Right. We would never right. do such a thing. Uh-huh. And, of course, it's no longer there. Well, the thing about it is, is when you're being misinformed, yeah, it's very it's very easy to, you know, to... Um, hear a lot of things that sounds reasonable whether they're going to follow through on it or mm-hmm. not. I mean, we heard, I was hearing, like I said early on, other things were being studied other than mm-hmm. the ring right. thing. Right. right. And people, you know, when I would say that, you know, no, that's not going to happen. Right. But we see now it has happened. Mm-hmm. So. And well, I remember in Reedsville with Brother Anders as our pastor. You're going to have to clarify for the congregation. Which, I which remember. <laughs> I remember in our local church in Reedsville, and our pastor was Brother Alan Anders, and we were still a part of the Church of God of Prophecy. And um, they sent out the video of, you know, the the situation with Thomason College and why it wasn't advisable to keep it. You know, and and then they would send out other information and all this, but you you felt so uninformed, yeah. right? Uh, right. I mean, they were saying no changes was coming, but at the same time, that was happening. Just replacements, right? <laughs> so I, as a member, and I refer to that because I feel like we all had a different place mm-hmm. in our walk with the Lord, in our status where we were working for the Lord. Um, I was a member. Just, you know, just a member, if you want to say it that way, yeah. uh, a choir director uh, who were we were working to see the church grow. Right. To get the message of the church out to the world. Right. Is that not what the Great Commission right. is? Right. Right. So right. that's what we were doing. But we were feeling so uninformed. Right. We were so, as I said earlier, we were disconnected from headquarters. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, the information was not right coming right. out. And it was mass confusion right. if you looked right. at it from right. a, a man's point of view. Right. But as Brother Dupree was talking and was talking about his sheep mm-hmm. and then this meeting in Jonesboro, mm-hmm. whether you should go right. or whether you shouldn't go, I was sitting here and I, I trying to keep myself together. <laughs> but I told Brother Jacob, I am so thankful for leadership that wanted to please God. Right. They yes. weren't interested. Yes. These men that we're talking about, I know there were some, maybe their motives were different, and God proved mm-hmm. that. 
But as you yes. look, the history, there were men yes. that were true men of God. They wanted the will of God. Right. Mm. They cared for their sheep. And I believe I am here today. I believe my family is here today because we had good leadership. Right. Right. And it wasn't only local. Right. But right. as you see, we've had the conversation. We've, we've had good leadership. Yeah. And I am thankful. For that. I just I thought it was interesting as we did the evening light in those early years yes. and and we started out with like 125 people or so on the mailing list and as it grew and grew mm -hmm. and all these Anders, <laughs> it's like Anders, I've never even heard that name before and I, I remember saying somebody did something right, somebody oh, has instilled right. a right. love for the church of God oh, in yeah. this family, I don't oh, know yeah. who they are but... Well, I remember the very first time I heard Stephen Smith, we were in the Reedsville Church and we had him on the phone. <laughs> and we were talking about tax ID numbers. <laughs> you remember yeah. that? So, that well, early yeah. on when you mm. were reorganizing, yeah. right, you yeah. that you had to have that. Right. Which is uh, why the church got out of the Bible for that yes. interim time. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that was a part of all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I, I did not know Sister... Uh, Sister Smith or Brother Smith. I did not know Brother Dupree, but these names become mm -hmm. more familiar because of their stand. Right. <laughs> it was their stand for God and for the church, and we felt connected. Yeah. Right. You know? right. And I'm thankful for that. Well, and the answer to all of these questions for all of these different people was no. Right. Do you want to abandon right. theocratic unanimous agreement in the church? No. 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 Right. Can we afford to dissolve Bible Training Institute? No. no. <laughs> Are we going to continue to allow, and they put this in all caps as well, so-called studies <laughs> of basic doctrines which have already been established in the church? Right. It's like they failed to, to remember that they were studied. Right. Right. The right. studies exactly. were already conducted. Already exactly. Yeah. Right. But, but they didn't settled. like the conclusion. The, the conclusion exactly. was wrong, right. Exactly. Will we allow obvious heretics to retain licenses in the church? Are we going to stick with the old paths? Are you concerned? And if you're concerned, this, the instructions were there of, of where to go and, and what to do during those times. And, you know, I'm very thankful for that leadership as well because, because you all stayed, because you all stood. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My wife is here. Right. My children one day will, will be here. And it's because someone took a stand. These concern meetings are are things of legend in, in the church. You wish that I had able to, been able to be a part of it. I'd like to show uh, one one clip here from Brother Campbell again uh, from the second concern meeting, which took place in Bessemer, Alabama, where about 800 were present, as the report goes. Maybe it's second. Brother Campbell is uh, speaking here about a, a little lady waving the flag, and I think you'll be able to uh, relate with her. And I remember one little lady had, uh, you'll have to kind of bear with me because even today, all these years later, it's a very emotional thing uh, for me to think about uh, the goodness of God and how he directed and ordered our steps. But I remember passing this little lady, and she was just waving her little flag. She didn't know me from anybody. But um, she looked at me, and she said, they told me that, they, that we were no longer in the church, and I couldn't wave my flag anymore, so I'm just going to wave it for Jesus. And so it made such a, a profound effect on me. I, I, uh, I saw a lot of things. I thought, saw a lot of hurt. I saw a lot of people that were commenting because of the hurt. Uh, simply because of the way that they had been treated during this time. I know in our own local church from the, inter not the interviews, but the way I was raised in my conversations with my father, um, our church had bought and bought their building and paid it off, had the mortgage burning, and had to do it all over all again over. during yes. this time, yes. buy it back all over again. And, um, you know, there's no telling how many little old ladies there were out there mm -hmm. that just found out. I'm no longer in God's church. And what a f frightening thing that must have been, not just to the little old ladies, but to the real big men <laughs> that, that existed at the time, you know, to, to, to 
have someone tell me that today that I'm no longer mm-hmm. in God's church, I'm no longer allowed to wave my flag, would would be a terrifying yeah. thing. I know in my local church when I went back from the solemn assembly, my commitment was that that I would go with this and and whoever would follow me. And so when I I announced to the church, it was my little old ladies that led the parade before anybody else got got in the line that said i'm going with this <laughs> so they they were they were the they were the backbone the strength right. that gave the rest That's of the courage right. to stand up and say we're going yeah. right <laughs> the the power of god brother campbell speaks about this uh, specifically in the lexington meeting and it's a it's a concern meeting that is discussed in almost every interview when you ask someone about the concern meetings if they attended Lexington is spoken about with such powerful preaching, mm-hmm. powerful demonstrations. I'd like to show that video of uh, Brother Campbell speaking about the power of God that was present in the Lexington concern meeting. I remember in Lexington the power of God that saturated that place was what I remembered as a child in the church with the glory of God filling that house, the power and the messages, the word of God, the spirit of God, the rejoicing in the spirit uh, was something I'd seen in many, many years. And I looked over and my mother had both her hands raised, worshiping the Lord. And I went over and I said, Bob, is this a Homer Thomas and Butch? And she said, oh no, son, this is old time church of God. In that interview, he discusses that that was the accusation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was it you said earlier about th- they were called something? They called us Judaizers. Is that the word you were? I no, know that that, that was really the concern was a oh, bunch, a of, bunch uh, of angry old men. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they left out the women. <laughs> they didn't say that. They just said angry old men. Right. <laughs> what it would have been to have been there and to, to experience yeah. that. What was, what amazes me so much? is that, see, up to the point of the concern beginning, and you were in these meetings in the Church of God of Prophecy, you felt a struggle in your spirit. Mm -hmm. But when you got to these meetings, what was so refreshing, it was so pure. Mm -hmm. And it was so free. free. And and it was as if you were like a a refreshing... It is right. right. It is still right. 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 You were allowed to speak of the beauty of right. the church. Yes. Right. Right. And that, right. that's what... You weren't what, crazy. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's what caused people to connect. Mm-hmm. We weren't just con- connecting to be... Uh, New friends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we were for the same cause, but it was the Spirit of God that yes. was connecting us. Mm-hmm. That's what we were rejoicing right. in. And as I sit there listening to Brother... Um, Campbell. Campbell speak about and his mom and about the lady wave, waving the flag. I feel in my spirit right. what right. they must have felt because it it doesn't leave you. Right. right. Even right. right now when I listen to that, I feel right. that it was so clean yeah. and it that's was a, so pure word. and mm-hmm. it was so refreshing. It was yes. like I'm home. Yes. This is, yes. this yes. is the no. church of God. Right. Yeah. This is the church of God. And that's what was so sweet. We weren't there. Nobody was there because they wanted to make a name. Right. If they were. Or trouble. Or they right, make trouble. Right. It right. was an underlying motive. No. It wasn't. You were there because you wanted to continue on right. in the truth. And right. as I listened to him, I said, oh, it was just pure. Right. It was clean. It right. was fresh. You didn't, how many of you felt that struggle, Brother Dupree? You had to have felt a struggle when you yeah. knew they were they were pulling the rug out from under you. They mm-hmm. were changing, listening to these assembly mm-hmm. uh, clips that we've watched, their struggle right. mm-hmm. in your breast. Yeah. You feel it. Right. Mm-hmm. Still feel but that. then when you still... When you hear them begin to say what it was like and, right. those, and know that you've been there. Right. Know, know that you've been in those services and what they're saying is true. Right. It's real. Right. Another Amen. dynamics of those meetings was there was some of some of the churches, like I think Brother and Sister Smith and their church was already dismissed mm-hmm. from the church. Right. Mm-hmm. So was right. Reedsville. So right. Was Reedsville. We were Reedsville. already, right. yes. So and we, we were being, nobody. We were being told how terrible these people were and how yeah. rebellious these people were. Right. And here we come in and make this connection with them, right. and we feel the spirit of the church 
uh, between us right, right. Uh, because we were struggling, even though we were still in the Church of God of Prophecy. Right. We were trying to find our way, and they were already dismissed right. from the Church of God of Prophecy. Well, and it's, it's almost like, you know, I work with young people a lot, and you get them to a camp or to a convention or to a youth service, and they pray through, they get saved, mm -hmm. and then they have to go back home. Mm -hmm. And home hasn't changed. Right, right. And I, I, I can only imagine what it must have felt like to leave a concern meeting and then go back to a Church of God of Prophecy State Convention. Yeah, yeah. Sister Campbell talks about that in a, in a video. I'd like to, to show that. Our state overseer had visited our local church, uh, the Woodbine Church of God of Prophecy, where uh, Brother Ray Dupree was our pastor. And... Um, he had the state officer had come to our church because he knew our, our congregation was upset with the changes that were being pushed through. And he asked us just to please forbear, just just love one another if um, if it's okay to be just very specific in the fact that um, if you see, you know if you don't believe in wearing jewelry, just don't wear it but love those that, that do, and, and forbear and work together. Let's let God just bring us together. And so with that thought in mind, the next week was our state convention. And when I went into the building, we're, we've always been ones to sit closer to the front because we don't want to miss anything that's going on. And I remember specifically just in the opening of the convention, uh, there was a choir that was brought front, up front, and it just so happened to be the local church of our state overseer. And it wasn't just one outward adornment. It, it, was, um, it, it was just all worldly, uh, and it troubled me so much. I remember staying, going out and staying in the ladies' restroom behind a stall, just weeping before the Lord. I thought, I can't, I can't even go in there and watch this. And so um, it just so happened that we were, were very good friends with the state overseer. My husband's family had, had grown up when they were younger together. So we had a very good relationship. And so after the convention, I thought, I, 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 I've got to do what the Bible says. I've got to talk to the overseer. And so what I, what I did was... I said, you came to our church uh, this last week. It might have been two weeks. But you came to our church, and you asked us to forbear one another. And then you prepared this program as the overseer from the people you knew um, how, they would, how they would appear on program. You knew that because you're a member of their local church. And uh, what about those forbearing with us that we knew that was, it was so heartbreaking that someone would uh, be presented before us to lead us in worship with the dramatic change. It doesn't matter whether it's a small change or a dramatic change, but this was a dramatic change in what we were told uh, that the purpose of the changes were. I remember the feeling that we had during that time when we had no government, we right. had no leadership. It's, it's sort of what I felt when my husband passed away. It's like there's like the protection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was taken away and all of a sudden it, we felt so vulnerable. Yes and just yes. desperate for God to somehow right, right. be our protector right. and our leader. Right. But yeah, you the, uh, Go ahead, Brother Dupree. The meeting that Sister Campbell was talking about with our overseer it occurred right before that uh, state convention. It led up to him announcing to them that he felt like that he would need to make a change in the appointment of, their, of myself as pastor there, that he felt like I just needed a new start and somewhere else and so it deteriorated from there uh, unfortunately and finally he he wanted me to dismiss the meeting and I said well I didn't I didn't start this meeting so you'll need to dismiss it <laughs> anyway we, we had mixed emotions we, we were 
dealing with that issue and then the the the, the messages and interpretations for the Solomon Assembly created excitement in us as well as his sister uh, has said about the fear and uh, cautiousness. Mm -hmm. But we got so excited, my wife and I, we obtained as many addresses as we could of the of the national overseers, and we put out letters and sent them to every national overseer that we had an address for, announcing there was going to be a solemn assembly, and they were invited to come to All right. it. <laughs> so because you was, trusted God. Yeah, right. we just trusted it would get to them somehow, uh, and they would at least know about it. And just, just, just a follow-up to that later on, uh, some did get through, and the overseer didn't come. But the fact that he made such a spill about it <laughs> that some of the members recognized there was something going on in the states mm -hmm. that was addressing the things that they were concerned about. Mm -hmm. And eventually people started coming in the countries to the church too. So, reminds yeah, me. well, there was a cautiousness. We were excited. We, right. You know, of course, I knew my days were, my days were numbered. And so right. I wanted to get involved and see what the Lord was going to do. Because, again, I, I wasn't ready to leave the church or see it divided, right. and, and I was going to get me a job and do whatever I could do right. to stay afloat, you know. Right. But I thought, wow. And But it, it was advertised in such a way, too, that the necessity of prayer and fasting yes. 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 leading yes. up yes. to and through right. yeah. that yes. solemn assembly. And, and when the Lord moved in the way that he moved, it, it was kind of a, a fearful thing to even think that you would stop fasting even though we received an answer. Right. right. Yes. That many, many of us, now some may not have, but many of us followed through all the way through yes. until the conclusion of that. Just in case. That. Just yes, in case. Yes. exactly, exactly, yeah. So it, it reminds me of that of the Scripture in, um, I believe it's Second Chronicles 20. And uh, if I'm wrong, tell me, but I don't think that I am. Um, Jehoshaphat says, neither know we what to do, yes. but our right. eyes are yes. upon thee. Right. Absolutely. And that is what we can take away. Whatever young person right. that's watching this today, they can take away that in the midst of difficult times, in the midst of difficult circumstances, when you don't know what mm -hmm. to do, you all are witnesses to the right. fact that God will not Amen. abandon you. Yes, he right. has never Amen. abandoned us. He is the Savior of the body. Amen. And it may not be in the way that anyone sitting in this building, even going into exactly. the solemn assembly to preach, Brother yeah. Dupree, yeah. Exactly. would have necessarily thought it was right. going to be. Right. But God delivered. Yes, God did. delivered yes, over and right. over and over again. I'd like to show one final clip of uh, Sister Campbell, if we could. The next week was the solemn assembly. I remember a brother passing me in the hall, and he, he could, anybody could see that I was, I was very upset. I was very emotional because I love the church of God with everything in me and the truth, the word of God. I saw that being just pulled out from under us. And so he, he just made, he said, hang on, Sister Campbell. We're going to the solemn assembly next week. And so that, that was uh, somewhat of a comfort, knowing that God was going to do something because I stand on the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And they did not prevail. God delivered his people once again, proving himself to be the provider, protector, deliverer, and ultimately the savior of the body. Join us next time as we discuss the full culmination of God's deliverance at the Solemn Assembly in a second roundtable discussion. Through our series, Remembering the Solemn Assembly, we hope you recognize that even in difficult circumstances, God will always deliver the faithful. The psalmist writes in Psalms 37 and 25, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. We invite you to join us for each of these special broadcasts. If you would like to study along with us, we have several great resources available through One Fold Bookstore to help further your study. These resources include a book of remembrance by these witnesses and highlights from the Solemn Assembly. God bless you and may God bless the Church of God as we endeavor to remember the Solemn Assembly for this and future generations.